Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, to the workshop, uh, to our workshop towards multi-purpose models of cortical circuits. Um, I am Anton Archipov, uh, an associate investigator at the Allen Institute in Seattle, and it is my honor and privilege to co-organize this workshop together with Professor Gauta Einewald of the University of Oslo and Norwegian University of Life Sciences. So we have an exciting program uh, covering the next three days, uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday. Uh, we'll start each day at 8 a.m. Pacific time and go until approximately noon. And every day there will be a series of talks. And the last session uh, on each day will be the panel discussion, where uh, all the speakers of the day will share their opinions on some interesting questions. So a few words uh, about what we'd like to achieve here. Um, by now, uh, we have a reasonably good understanding of the principles by which single neurons operate and process information. However, such understanding is much more limited uh, for large networks of such neurons in the cortex and elsewhere in the brain. And these circuits uh, and networks, they operate under many different conditions and they contribute to a wide variety of functions. And this is why we are talking about multipurpose models in this workshop. We will explore how we can move towards models that incorporate the true biological complexity and faithfully reproduce not just uh, a single phenomenon or computation of interest, but multiple observations uh, in many different situations. So our speakers will discuss different types of models and experiments, uh, and we hope that these conversations will help to build stronger connections between modeling and experimentation. And we also emphasize in this workshop the free sharing of data, models, and software, which is essential for reproducibility and for the overall success of this enterprise. So before we begin, I would like to thank Gaute uh, for the hard work co-organizing the workshop and also Christoph Koch, the chief scientist of the MindScope program at the Allen Institute for his support of this event from the very beginning. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, we are really glad to hear from you over these three days. And thanks to you, all the attendees. And finally, special thanks to the Allen Institute communications team, Ashley, Kathleen, uh, Megan and Christina who have been truly amazing and worked very hard to put together this workshop. So thank you, enjoy the workshop. And our first speaker of the day is Professor Gauta Einewald. And his talk is titled Towards a Multipurpose Cortical Network Model. Hey, I'm Gauta Einewald and I'm extremely happy about this, this event. Of course, Anton and I have been talking about this for a long time and it's sort of, a, I mean, it's before the pandemic, we were thinking maybe having a physical meeting at Allen and there were like 40, 50 participants. Of course, this couldn't happen, but now at least we have an opportunity to reach many more people. So it's sort of like a blessing in disguise or whatever. So let's see if I'm able to switch to the slides. So I think, um, I mean, if you sort of look at the situation in, in systems neuroscience, uh, it's, it's really, until now, the focus has really been focusing on neural representations. Yeah, I'll tell you yet sharing if you want. I'm not sharing. Let's see if I'm sharing. How do I do that then? Let's see. How do I get back and share? Let me see. Share screen. Okay, now maybe. Am I sharing now? Perfect. Ah, oh, excellent. Yeah, so as, uh, as I, let's see, why is this so difficult then? So, I mean, if you, if you sort of look at, uh, I mean, the state is, I would say, in system neuroscience. So far, we have largely focused on neural representations, right? I mean, and particularly when it comes to the, I mean, primary visual cortex, maybe the most studied piece of, of cortex there is, and, and going back to the work of Jubel and Wiesel, we have mapped out this, we meaning the community, and mapped out all these receptive fields. And, and we have all these like new, this kind of different kinds of cells that has been mapped out in V1. And simple cells, orientation selective cells, uh, and so on. And I think that it's like this, the status of this was sort of summarized in this, uh, this 
multi-author perspective paper came out in 2005 asking the question, do we know what the early visual system does? And these are like well-known visual neuroscientists. And in the first line of the abstract, they say, we, we can claim that we know what the visual system does once we can predict neural responses to arbitrary stimuli, including those seen in nature. And with that, I mean, from that, uh, I mean, that statement is, or it is, we are certainly not in that situation now. I think even if you sort of look at like receptive fields found from like simple stimuli, drifting gratings and so on, and, 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 and you can sort of extract mathematical models, but these models are not able to predict like the, the responses to, to natural images. But what they're really asking for here is what we call a, a multi-purpose model. And I think I, I agree with, uh, I mean, certainly with, with Anton that we need some kind of, I think we need sort of like take into account the real biological complexity in these models and, and to sort of put this like neurons together in a network and see if we can sort of up, get closer to this goal. And the good thing is that we know how to model neurons. I think starting with the work of Hodgkin and Huxley, we now have a way to, to, to make good neuron models. And, and there's now even a, like a databases of, of neuron models, uh, which are then uh, corresponding to neurons of different parts of cortex and other, other brain regions, different animals and so on. However, when it comes to networks, going from neurons to networks, we are not doing so well. Well, well in some sense we're doing okay because we know, we know the principles for how to model them. We can sort of hook up uh, hook these neurons up in networks. I mean, all they can model synapses and so on. It's just that it's very difficult to make this model mimic anything that you measure in experiments in terms of network uh, activity. And, and we wrote the perspective article. Uh, I'm involved in the Human Brain Project, uh, and we wrote a perspective article on this on the, why we need then large-scale networks and large-scale brain simulations to try to bridge this gap. Not that you sort of, you can sort of put these neurons together and you sort of like, voila, you get out this, this uh, network that agrees with experiment, but you need these simulations to test uh, hypotheses. And what we sort of argued for there is that you need this, what's called multi-level, multimodal modeling needed to check candidate theories. So for the case of the primary visual cortex, say in, in mice, you would like to have not only a, a not only a model in terms of biophysically detailed neurons. You would also like to have like corresponding models at, at the coarser level. I mean, coarser detail, maybe at the point neural level, and also these firing rate uh, populations. You need sort of like a, you need to like dip models at different scales to sort of to get the to get the best understanding and the comprehensive understanding. Uh, uh, and then, but in order to get that model, you, you want to model to, to models to predict not only spikes. That's typically be the thing that we have compared models with spikes, as the spikes produced. You also need to be able to com uh, compare your model predictions with other signals like the local field potential, that's a low frequency part of electrical potentials, or ECOG and EEG and MEG and so on. And then you should sort of go back and forth within models and data. To, uh, to be able to sort of like to, to get closer to maybe like get better candidate models and um, models that are in better agreement with, with experiments. And, uh, <coughs> and this will sort of like be sort of some kind of iterative loop. And this requires a lot of, I mean, not only this requires uh, a lot of work to make these candidate models and it also takes, uh, it takes a lot of work to actually to, to make efficient and scripts and so on, and you need strong computers and so on to be able to do this in an efficient way. And if you look at sort of the present models of primary visual cortex, I think uh, at the most coarse grained level, we have a lot of, uh, of quite useful models at I would say at the level of firing rate populations, maybe looking at in particular on, on like responses of, of neurons in layer four, the input layer of visual cortex receiving input from thalamus where you have this typically this low dimensional model, meaning that one or two dynamical variables, you're making one or two populations, uh, and which then uh, predicts things like orientation selectivity and contrast invariance to stimuli and, and, and so on. But they are typically what are called single purpose. I mean, there may be, they can sort of explain some experiments like orientation selectivity, but maybe, I mean, fails on other things are not really easy to test on other things either. 
And then you have these more, these other types of models and where you try to make actually much more, bring in much more of the complexity like this cat V1 column model by Potians and Diesman, 80,000 neurons, uh, point neurons, which were sort of hooked up based on what's known about synaptic connections and so on. And then I would say like the, the thing that came out last year or this year actually published um, uh, work from, uh, from Anton's team at Allen, where they had this Allen, the V1 model, 230,000 neurons, which actually came in two variations, both with biophysically detailed neurons, multi-compartment neurons, but also in a point neuron uh, version. And so, and, but the thing is that these, these, I would say like these level two and level one models are not yet, yet connected to this at the level three. I mean, you cannot derive these population firing rate models from these, these large scale network models. This eventually we would like to be able to do. So, so what are multi-purpose models? Well, multi-purpose models is sort of models that simultaneously can predict experimental data for different stimuli and, and maybe also, at, also for individual trials, uh, but also for different measurement types and, and maybe also then for different brain states. And I, well, at least I think that multi-purpose models must likely be high dimensional. I mean, many dynamical variables like in, like in real brains. And then at the end of the day, it should be re reducible to several single purpose models at level three, like firing rate models, which explains like different, different um, phenomena. Actually the first person or actually the first group or maybe the person trying to make this, I would say like biophysically detailed models were, was Roger Traub. He made this well-known uh, model of somatosensory cortex, three and a half thousand neurons or something with, was actually quite stylized neurons. And he starts his paper by saying, well, the greatest scientific challenge, perhaps in all of brain research, is how to understand the cooperative behavior of large numbers of neurons. And he says, any model, even of a small bit of cortex, is subject to difficulties and hazards, like limited data, large number of parameters, the expense and slowness of the necessary computations, and serious uncertainties as to how a complex model can be compared with experiment and shown to be predictive. The above difficulties and hazards are too real to be dismissed, to be dismissed readily. And which this is certainly something we, uh, we agree with. These are still difficulties. And he goes on to say, in our opinion, the only way to proceed is to a state of denial that any of the difficulties need to be fatal. The reader must then judge whether results preliminary as they must be help our understanding. And I think these are, I think compared to 2005, this is still, I mean, you still need, uh, you need, well, I think you still need to be quite optimistic and, and not sort of be in this that you don't think that any of these limitations is, are going to be fatal. But I think that applies to many ambitious uh, research uh, projects. But also we are in a much better state than we were in, in 2005. And I think particularly, I would say, uh, not working at the Allen Institute, maybe particularly because of the work that has been done at the Allen Institute, because they are now focused on, on this, this mouse V1, which allowed the uh, Anton's group uh, to, to be able to make this based on known, like had all this prior data uh, for like with the mouse physiology and anatomy from V1, which allowed them to make this, this sort of like a, was like a candidate model uh, first candidate model, maybe a skeleton model, you can call it, because it's, it has the right skeleton, but the parameters needs to be sort of to be, is, is unknown. Uh, and then this was something that they sort of like published, and this is also a model that is publicly available. So uh, you can actually make a, like a, I mean, a community working on the same, uh, same model. And then in order to do, use this, right, if you want to find, try to, to use this model to find like, essentially tune the parameters to find a model that is, explains a lot of the mouse V1, maybe so like towards a multipurpose model. You need to take this model and choose some stimuli and input data. And, and because this V1 receives both feed forward input, say from LGN, but also feedback input from higher visual areas. And this, this, this input data can either be, I mean, it could be recorded uh, like they've done at, at Allen, uh, or it can be modeled based on some kind of like receptive field models, descriptive models. 
So then also what you need, you need a, a rich data set to validate your model. And, and now what came out recently was that they had like this I don't know, data from 60 mice, uh, almost 60 mice, and they had like, which was, which uh, were recorded from in a very like a, a similar way, a stereotyped way with six of these neuropixel probes going through not only V1 and LGN, but going through also these higher vision areas. And then you have to make a decision, what should we model really try to target? Should you try to make a model for one mouse or maybe like some kind of average mouse or should it be better at predicting spikes in LFD and so on? But anyway, if you made this, decide on this signal target, then you need to be able to compute these brain signals. And then if you're able to compute these brain signals then corresponding to this particular like implementation of the model, then you need to compute, compare essentially what the deviation for the for a set like metric distance measure. And then you, you go into this iteration loop trying to modify the parameters <coughs> and then um, uh, adapt the parameters into you sort of get sort of like deviation between model predictions and experiments as low as you, well, have you set as a criteria. And then you sort of get this sort of like a fitted V1 model, which is then the best V1 model given the present data. Of course, now also on the way is new prior, new data from the Allen on synaptic physiology and electron microscopy. And this can be used as new prior data to, to get like a different prior model, which can then iterate in this, this loop again. There are some particular features of this, which at least something I've sort of learned start thinking about uh, recently is, um, is that we are so used to optimizing models with few parameters, like low dimensional models, for example, like this firing rate models. And they're typically, the cost landscape is like wavy like this. And the idea is that if you start with a model like this, you can sort of find your way into the bottle, uh, bottom here, declare victory. If you start up there, however, uh, you can sort of get stuck in a local minimum. So there is this, <coughs> unique optical model at the bottom there, but you easily get stuck in local minima during fitting. However, with many parameters, like you have in this level one and level two network models, um, then the, the, the bottom of the, this cost landscape is flatter uh, because it's, it has to do with the sloppiness of models. If you have many parameters, many, many models give, many parameter choices give the same, essentially like the best similar kind of quality fit to the data. So that means that you, if you start here, you might end up here, find this little optimal model. And if you start there, you find another optimal, optimal model. So there are many optimal models, but the good thing that is you're not easily stuck in local minima during fitting. And this was actually something I learned from reading a paper by Terry Sanofsky, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Deep Learning and Artificial Intelligence, came out this year. So where actually this was sort of uh, like an explanation for why these uh, why these deep networks are so efficient in, in sort of being trained to image categorization. It's like you have all these parameters and there's always all these equivalent like optimal models that you can find which are not identical, but which are performing equally well. And actually, if you want to learn more about this, I have this podcast in my podcast series, Sense and Science with Terry, where we talk about, talk about this. But another thing we need to do is actually to compute brain signals. And this is sort of like a separate kind of calculation. I mean, <coughs> if you, I mean, typically you've been measuring spikes and, and maybe comparing model prediction with spikes, but also now with this, all these like the, the neuropixel probes, they here, there you can also pick out things like the local field potential. And of course, with other electrodes placed other places, you can pick up things like EEG or even measuring magnetic field, get MEG. And then you have the whole bunch of optical, optical measurements. So how can we take advantage of all this data in this model validation? Well, a key thing is that this is, this phys, you can do this physics type modeling of brain signals. That you say, if you have a model for a neuron like this one, you, and you have, uh, then you can sort of compute actually what a spike from that neuron would look like. It has to do with the weight of somewhat transparent currents in the SOMA region. And LFP and EEG, MEG actually has to do with the weight of somewhat transparent currents all over the neuron and optical measurements like all the sensitive dye imaging is, is has something to do with a, like average membrane potential up in the apical dendrites and so on. 
So we need to work out these mathematical connections between neuron dynamics and the different experimental modalities. And, and this is sort of like a separate part of computational neuroscience. It doesn't have to do with information flow. It's more like a measurement physics. <coughs> but this is a, a key thing that you need in order, if you have a candidate mathematical model for say network dynamics in mouse V1, you should be able to predict all available measurement modalities, all the data you have, because that puts more constraints on the model. And we have worked a lot in our group in Norway, worked a lot on making these, um, uh, making models for the, I mean, how to compute these electrical signals. And, and we have developed this tool, uh, LFPi, uh, which is then, because not everybody has to reinvent this wheel. They can actually use, use sort of like the wheel we have invented uh, or, or any other like tool for computing brain signals. And, <coughs> This is actually this, this, this element of, of computing electrical signals, extracellular electrical signals like spikes, LFP, EEG, and MEG. It's, like it's, it's, it's well established by something called uh, volume conductor theory. And this is sort of like the formula I'd use in the simplest case where you sum up over contributions from transfer and currents. But, but uh, the, you can also modify it to more complicated cases. The key thing here is that, for example, that you get the LFP is not a measure of the firing rate. Here's like an example where you have one pyramidal neuron that gets a synaptic input in, on the left side, it's the, from, the, from the apical synapse, and from the right side, it's at the, uh, the, the, uh, in the soma. Both the, the, the firing rates, resulting firing rates could be the same, but the LFP pattern will be opposite. So you have to do this, you cannot sort of like, no simple rule of thumb can sort of be used to explain LFP, but the good thing is we know how to model it. That's sort of like volume conductor theory is quite well established. So <coughs> one, then one thing we can do is sort of then to compute, for example, this is just illustrating the effects of, of how, how actually get different frequency responses. You get a very different frequency response if you have a one hertz signal driving an epical neuron than a hundred hertz signal. So there will be a strong bias toward the one hertz thing just because of the, 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 the biophysical properties of the neuron, even though the firing rate has the same amplitude. So this is just something we have to do properly. And then we can also then compute not only LFPs, but also EEG and ECOG and so on. And <coughs> here's an example actually where we have a 10,000 biophysically detailed neural models. And what we, with a local field potential going through the, well, you measure the local field potential in the, in the laminar electrode, multi-electrode going through the middle here. And we can see that in this case, we, we drive them, uh, drive these neurons uh, sometimes all over the place like now, or, or maybe at the top like now. And we can see that we get very different local field potentials. And also on the right here, you can see you get very different EEG and MEG contributions, uh, even though the synaptic or the excitation of these neurons could be the, the same. But the point is we can now compute all these signals. If you have the model, you can compute the signals. We can also use this for point neurons, uh, even though point neurons themselves do not compute, uh, do not make extracellular potentials. You need multi-compartmental models. But you can, yes? It's 10 minutes. Left. Okay, good. So, um, uh, yeah, so let's see. So here it's, um, uh, in this case, if we use this potion Stiesman model, 80,000 neurons. <coughs> and, um, uh, yeah, and, and it's like corresponding to about one square millimeter of cortex. And these point neurons, as I said, do not predict extracellular potentials. However, we can do this trick so we can use point neuron simulations like we use in, in NEST, for example, to compute the spiking activity. And this is just showing a raster plot of these neurons across the, in this case, across the cortical layers. And, um, and what we see here is that, well, it's like at time 900, you get this input from thalamus. So you get this strong activation like here, you can see this strong activation across cortex and, and other, other times it's just like, some kind of background activity. But the thing is we can sort of store all these spikes and then we can in the second calculation actually replace each of these 80,000 point neurons with 80,000 multi-compartment neurons and replay the spikes essentially and use them as presynaptic sort of activators and then compute 
things like the LFP. You see, it doesn't happen much except at 900, you get this strong LFP spreading across the cortex. And at the same, you can also then compute the EEG contribution at the top of the, at the, top of the head. So, <coughs> so we are trying just to sort of, uh, the, the reason we sort of, I mean, the reason Anton and I got interested in making this workshop was that it was a background of, a, of a collaboration we have, have, um, have been working on for a couple of years, where we sort of want to use this, the, the models that we made in this group and also to, to see if we can sort of constrain it better by not only compared with spikes, but also with um, LFPs. And uh, Anton will talk more about the model uh, later. So here's just an, like an early example result. Uh, and one thing uh, we realized actually is that, so here's like the LFP from a simulation, and, and this is LFP from ex an experiment, or a mouse experiment, but this is like trial average. And it's like a full field white flash stimulus coming up at, at like 50, like 30, 14. Well, it's turned on at zero milliseconds, but the, the response in the cortex started like at 40 milliseconds or something. But this is what we've seen after looking into this, this experimental data. There's a lot of variability. So, but at least this is just here we can actually compare CSD from a model with CSD from an experiment, and then we can start sort of like see how we can, <coughs> how we can sort of make, well, get the closer correspondence. And here's the same thing for the, for the fire rates. So the point is that this is here, we can, <coughs> we can actually sort of then gradually sort of, we can try out different essential parameter choices and then see how we can get a better agreement between experiments and models. Of course, this is a big, it's not even a project, it's more like a program. But at least when you have these, are able to compute the brain signals and uh, the, the same things that you measure, then you can actually sort of have like objective ways to finding out whether you're doing, doing better or not. So, um, so people say, well, you know, with five parameters, uh, you can sort of fit an elephant or whatever. But this, uh, in my experience, in our experience, when you, that, that applies to statistical fitting to, to functions. But when you want to fit a mechanistic model, and turn on network parameters, this is not very easy at all to make contact with, with experiments. So the problem is not now that we have too many models that actually fit the data. And the mother, that's not the problem. We don't have any model that really fits the data at the, at the moment, but that we have a way to make, make progress. Okay, so that's what I plan to, uh, to say. I don't know if there's been any stop sharing maybe, how should I do this? I can look at the Q and A, right? So this is a little bit uh, because I'm going to be the moderator for the rest of the rest of the day. So I will have to be my own. Oh yeah, would you mind repeating the name of the podcast you mentioned? Yeah, it's called uh, Sense and Science. So uh, will PowerPoints from the presenters be released with the recordings? Uh, I would be happy to share mine at least. Quite sure they will. Okay, and then uh, spikes are typically regarded as ground truth for neural activity, whereas other measurement modalities such as EEG serve as proxies whenever recording sp spikes is difficult. In your opinion, what is the purpose of multimodal modeling if we have access to spiking data for a particular experimental condition? Well, I actually think a, a very important thing here is that uh, even like with the last neuropixel probes, which are like state of the art, you typically record maybe from 70 neurons across the visual, across the visual cortex. So it's like a very sort of like, like it was an undersampled system. While the LFP actually is a measure of a bunch of spikes feeding into it. So I don't see, uh, and also with, with spikes, that's also some sense you have to do some processing, spike sorting and so on. So I don't see any principal differences between recording spikes and recording LFPs and using them to, to validate models. I think actually in some sense, LFPs will be very useful because they are less, it's easier to get sort of, you, you're sampling from in some sense, you're sampling from a larger, many, many more spikes at the same time because it's, that's sort of what the LFP signal comes from. And then a good question. Once we have the corresponding data slash figures for a simulation, 
versus the experiment, how to quantify how well the model is doing. So that, that is a very good question. I'm not quite sure. I don't think there's like a, a simple answer to that. I guess it, it's always this question, what do you think is, what do you think is the most salient thing to reproduce, right? And, and probably then you have to sort of, there will be different opinions of that. And that's something we actually plan to, to, uh, to discuss during this, this, this um, yeah, during this, this, this workshop.